Sean Great stalked Northern Ohio between 2006 and 2016, slaughtering women after assaulting them. He's now on death row awaiting execution, thanks to one would-be victim's bravery. The following 911 call you're about to hear is of that would-be victim and is possibly one of the most tense 911 calls you'll ever hear. On September 13, 2016, Ashland police received a phone call from an unknown woman who police referred to as Jane Doe, who whispered that she had been kidnapped and was tied up mere feet away from her sleeping abductor. She tried to describe the man who was holding her captive and the house she was in. The best she could manage was that it was next to the 4th Street laundromat. What is the address to your emergency? By the 4th Street Laundry Mat. What is it? 4th Street Laundry Mat. What's the problem? I've been abducted. Who abducted you? John Green. You said John Green? Sean Greg. Where's she at now? Asleep. Where's she sleeping at? In the bedroom. In what bedroom? There's two houses right by the laundry street. And it's in one of those houses. What color is the house? Yellow. Please hurry. Is it an apartment? No, it's a house. Okay, does he own the house? No, he broke into it. Does anybody actually live there? I think they've been abandoned. Does he have a weapon? He's got a taser. Are you injured? A little. Where did he take you from? My, my apartment. I mean, I was walking with him. You were walking with him? Mm-hmm. Where were you walking to? His place. I had known him for like a month and a half. Is there any way you can get out of the building? I don't know without waking him, and I'm scared. Is there a bathroom in the the house? Well, his bedroom is closed, and he made it so it would make noise. But if you told him you had to go to the bathroom, he would do something to you? Yeah, because he had me tied up. Are you tied up now? Well, I... Yeah, but I kind of freed myself. Is he in the same room with you? Yes. Are you bleeding from anywhere? Not anymore. Oh shit. Oh shit, I woke him up. Just set the phone down. While the nine one one dispatcher continued talking the caller through escaping, Jane accidentally knocked over her captor's taser, waking him. The line went dead briefly, and she was suddenly minutes away from being the sixth victim of the serial killer, Sean Great. And by this point, the police knew they had to race if they wanted any chance of saving the helpless woman. Great sat up in his bed and stared at the floor, before laying back down again, not realizing that Jane was on the phone with the police. Are you still there? I'm a stalker. What? I'm a stalker. Do you hear any officers outside? No. Okay, they're in the area. Can you get out of the house? It's locked. It's locked. Are you at the door? Yeah, I am. She's at the door. She's at the door on the right side of the house. She got out of the bedroom. Is there a window there? Yeah, I'm looking out. If they come, they'll come back. She said to... Hurry, hurry. She said to hurry up and come back. Yeah, they can see me if they it's come locked. to it. The door is locked. Come out, come out, hurry up, hurry up, get out of here. Where is he? Bedroom sleeping. Still sleeping? Yeah. Okay, they have her. He's not armed. He's not armed? Yeah. Come here, come here. The rescue of the woman and arrest of Great was heard on the call. 
Thankfully, the woman survived this ordeal, though likely not without having some lasting scarring effects on her. As a teenager growing up in Marion, Ohio, Sean Great was well-liked, particularly by girls. He had a charm about him that would mask his inner rage, at least for a while. When he was 18, he was arrested for grabbing his then-girlfriend by the throat. A few years later, he was arrested for breaking into his 17-year-old girlfriend's home and choking her, and only eight months later, he broke into the same girl's house again, this time slipping underneath her couch and hiding until he saw an opportunity to strike. This time he had a butcher knife in hand. But Great's charm and artificial friendliness allowed him to go on and have three children with three different women, but his inner anger would never lay dormant for long. His ex-wife, Amber Nicole Bowman, claims that Sean at one point said, if I can't see my daughter, no one will. By his mid to late 20s, Great's behavior became more erratic. He would begin dating Christina Hildreth. The pair were happy and content in the beginning, but Great couldn't hide his true colors for long. Not only did he become violent, controlling, and jealous, he would also show signs of being cold and indifferent towards his confused girlfriend, and would eventually end up physically abusing her. So was he violent with you? Yes. In, in what way? Um, he broke my hand, blacked my eye, strangled me, tied me up. But his hostility would soon extend beyond just romantic partners and even to friends when he asked his friend for a loan, which was declined, and in response, he sent his friend a disturbing text saying, meet the other me. Eventually, Great would find himself living in Mansfield, hopping from woman to woman, and around this time, he met his first two victims, Rebecca Lisi and Candace Cunningham, Rebecca was a sex worker, and her body was found in March 2015. Her death was ruled an overdose originally, but Great later pleaded guilty to her murder. Candace Cunningham lived with Great in Mansfield before her disappearance in 2015. Police couldn't find her until the day of Great's arrest, when he led police to her body, which was lying behind a burned-down house in Richland County on the day of his arrest. Great managed to somehow become even more barbaric towards his next and final victim, Jane, who you heard in the phone call just before. Jane met Sean Great around her apartment complex, and he eventually gained her trust. That was when he exposed her to his true self. He trapped her in an abandoned house and forced her to endure days of torture and other unspeakable things while she was tied up. Great barely slept on the first night of his victim's capture, giving her no chance of escape. However, after another day of torture, Great eventually passed out. His phone was right next to him going off, but he was seemingly in a very deep sleep. So Jane took this opportunity as her likely last chance to escape alive, and she reached over his sleeping body as stealthily as she could to pick up the phone and dial 911 while still partially bound. And that was the start of the 911 call. When police arrived at the property, they were met with more bodies than they'd expected. Great had been mercilessly killing the women who were unfortunate enough to trust him, and some of them were decomposing in the house he was squatting in. The 911 operator received a lot of hate and ridicule over her loud voice and constant seemingly unnecessary questions during the call, as many people believe she could have very easily led to Great being awoken, either by the sound of her voice or because of all the questions she was making Jane answer. Thankfully, things went the way they did, and this 911 call was a very fortunate story, as it got a monster off the streets who no doubt wouldn't have stopped doing what he was doing. The call you're about to hear was made by millionaire James Bob Ward, reporting that he had just shot his wife. His tone throughout the call is very monotone, calm, and nonchalant, considering the matter for which he's making the call. The real estate mogul claims he walked into his and his wife's room to turn in for the night, and was shocked to find his allegedly depressed and intoxicated 51-year-old wife, Diane, holding his Magnum handgun. Bob says the weapon accidentally discharged while he was struggling to get it away from her before she could kill herself or him or the both of them. This was the call. Now it's the emergency. I just shot my wife. You just what? I just shot my wife. Where's your wife? She's right here on the floor. We sent, we sent somebody at 5277 Iworth. Country Club Drive. Okay, what's going on there? I just shot my wife. You just shot your wife? I shot my wife, yes, please. Send somebody over. Don't mind with me. Let me add the fire department. Don't hang up. I will be. Where's the weapon at, sir? Orange County Fire Rescue. The address of your emergency? 44. 5277. 
I was country club dry. I'm there. I just shot my wife. Okay, where's the weapon? It's in the, um... Yes. I'm sorry? Where, where, is she breathing? No, she's dead. Do you know that for sure? I think so, yes. Okay, sir, where, where is the weapon? It's in the nightstand next to the bed, the master bedroom. And I'll be glad to meet the officer, officer that I'm for. Where is your wife, my name, sir? She's in the floor in the master bedroom. How old is she? Born in 1954. Okay, you're sure there's, she's not breathing or? She's dead. She's done. I'm sorry. Sir, did you purposely do this? No. Or was it an accident? It was an accident. How long ago did this happen, sir? Probably five minutes ago. I'm on the front steps. You're out on the front there. steps? Yeah, I'm on the front steps. Okay. And they're on the front gate from the front steps to the upstairs and the front dining room. Yeah, they're there being the attacked. You told me to the back up. Do you see the deputy? Yeah, I see lights, but then some of them back up. That's them back up. Hey, guys, over here. Over here. Bob was charged with second-degree murder of Diane. He has always claimed the gun went off when he was trying to get it away from Diane, but prosecutors believe the two were arguing over financial problems, and that's why Bob shot her. Now it was up to a jury to decide. But to this day, the question is, was Diane Ward's death really just a tragic accident? Or did her husband Bob murder her in cold blood? Well, not too long ago, a significant discovery of a letter from the grave may finally answer the question that's confounded the justice system and haunted the Ward family since the day Diane died. Bob and Diane had it all, a happy 26-year-old marriage, two daughters, and enough money to own numerous luxurious estates in several states. Daughters Sarah and Mallory say they and their parents were a loving, tight-knit family. But eventually, Bob's real estate empire collapsed under the weight of the Great Recession. And even though Bob was facing bankruptcy, his daughters claimed he remained optimistic. But not Diane, who grew increasingly low-spirited over the prospect of losing the family fortune. Sarah said her mother vainly tried to ease her depression with booze and prescription drugs, and that she would turn into a different person far from the loving mom she knew, and completely out of control even in public. She said her mother was also directing all her anger and resentment at her father after having to cut back on some of the luxuries the family grew used to. And Sarah says her father was like her mother's punching bag. Bob's defense attorneys painted Diane as a suicidal and unstable person. And in 2018, his defense attorneys produced new evidence. A suicide note written by Diane was found in the couple's Atlanta home. It was reportedly found by an estate sales professional in the closet in the master bedroom. She stated that she was on a ladder in a small closet in the bedroom when she noticed a pink notebook next to some hair rollers. She opened the notebook and found a note and some cards with Diane Ward printed on them. The alleged suicide note read, Dear Mallory and Sarah, please know how much I love you. I don't know how it happened for me to end up like this. I want you to have wonderful lives and know that I will always be watching out for both of you. Take care of Daddy. I love you more than you will ever know. Take care of the dogs. They will need you. Defense attorneys claim that a former FBI handwriting expert could testify that he thinks the handwriting is indeed that of Diane Ward. So this all begs the question, is what Bob says true? Was his shooting of his wife an accident? But if this were the case, Bob's calm and seemingly unaffected tone over the phone with 911, and even during his police interrogation, wouldn't make much sense. Then you're doing it rather than reading glasses, anybody has. <laughs> sure. I Thank, have, I have, Thank you so much. Thank you. I have my pair. Thank you. I, may have I have a folding them. pair, but I think they took them. Thank you. Oh. oh like I said, I'm Detective Frost. Uh, I didn't get your name, your first name. I go by Bob. Okay. But it's James Robert. It would be a safe assumption that anyone who just accidentally murdered their wife would show any kind of remorse or regret. But Bob was calm and seemingly unaffected throughout. He's still in prison today. This last one has been circulating the internet for decades, and you've likely heard it before. In fact, I've included it in a video I privated many years ago, I'm sure some of you remember. But new information has arisen on this call recently. 
Uh, this is the roof cry to 3877. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been uh, taking the place out. Well, well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And yes. And uh, said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm real, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Mm -hmm. where, where is he now, ma'am? I don't have no idea. <laughs> For the longest time, this phone call was commonly just referred to as things like old woman murdered during 911 call. For a long time, people speculated that this call is just a hoax or a choreographed recording for 911 operator training. Eventually, though, the woman's name was revealed to be Ruth Price, and it was learned that the call was in fact real. However, the internet was still having a hard time gathering any further information on this Ruth Price woman or what her fate was after the phone call. The unfortunate assumption that she was murdered shortly after this call was always the go-to assumption. At the beginning of the call, Ruth begins to give her address as 3877, but is cut off by the 911 operator. During this 911 call, Ruth presents herself as an elderly woman who's concerned about a man who knocks on her door saying he's looking for an apartment. Ruth pauses after giving this information, then you hear a blood-curdling scream, and Ruth says something about not being able to breathe. Recently, though, information as to who this Ruth Price woman was finally surfaced. Ruth Mildred Starr was born in Pueblo, Colorado on December 7, 1913. Ruth went to Central High School in Pueblo, Colorado, and this was her yearbook photo. Ruth's obituary was recently found, which shows that she died in 1994 in the San Diego Union Tribune. Ruth was also mentioned in a newspaper section called Assaults on November 3, 1980 in the San Diego Evening Tribune. In this newspaper clipping, it says Ruth M. Price was assaulted on the 3800 block of 35th Street. Uh, this is the Ruth Price of 3877. This newspaper clipping which you see here fits the Ruth Price 911 call perfectly. It wasn't a hoax and it wasn't a 911 training call. That blood-curdling scream was unfortunately very real. But fortunately, even in Ruth's old age, she managed to fight off her attacker and live for another 14 years. What seems like a realistic possibility now is that this call was used to shock trainees for 911 call taking because of how blood curdling and disturbing her panic screaming was, and thus was born the legend of an old woman brutally murdered while on the phone with 911. At least this story had a much happier ending than originally thought.